So we're going to go to the uh, kings, the southern kingdom, and uh, I'd like to just quickly remind ourselves, uh, when we say the southern kingdom, uh, you know, hopefully you don't think that we're talking about America, you know, the north and the south. Um, we have uh, here, well, I don't have a way to post this up here, but I have here uh, a large map of the kingdoms of Judah and Israel, and the southern kingdom, basically if you... Generally, you want to go to the north end of the Dead Sea and put a line almost straight across. Jerusalem is just above the, the, the plain of the, did I say the Red Sea? The Dead Sea, if I said the Red Sea. Um, this just basically you can put a line across here, everything to the south, everything to the north. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom. And uh, let's see if it's on here. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. And, of course, it takes the split right after Solomon uh, because of his uh, sin of marrying many wives and the worship of false gods, because of his many alliances with uh, other kingdoms that God wasn't pleased with. And, um, oh, and then the, then the obvious thing is that his son uh, would not, Lower the taxes, Rehoboam, which we're going to look at today. Okay, so southern kingdom, basically the north end of the Dead Sea is the northern kingdom going north. And uh, the northern kingdom falls much sooner than the southern kingdom because they're much, much more wicked. Uh, by the way, looking at this map, it doesn't show, yes it does, Bethel and Dan. Okay, so these two places, locations, were where the golden calves were set up. And uh, at Dan, that very location has been rediscovered. Uh, there's, it's very obvious that that's the temple, and they believe that's the location of, the, uh, of that golden calf up in the northern kingdom. So obviously at Bethel was to keep the people from going back to the southern kingdom, to Jerusalem, to uh, worship the Lord. So. All right, I have references for you. We're not going to look at all of these, but I do want you to look at the first one here for sure in your Bible. 1 Kings chapter 1. I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 11 is about Solomon and his uh, downfall. When we, by the time we get to 1 Kings chapter 12, we uh, have the death of Solomon and a new king, his son Rehoboam, coming to the throne. <clears throat> Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel come to Shechem to make him the king. Now, Rehoboam is one of many, 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 many sons of Solomon. Right? <laughs> he had many, many wives. Okay, so, yes? Um, just out of that, I just came across this a couple weeks ago, but someone, a commentator in the Bible, was saying that Solomon only had one son and two daughters. He said that that there's, there's nowhere that says he had a lot of sons. I've never heard that before. I'm wondering. Okay, there, I doubt there's much credibility. I don't know, I know where they come from. It seems like, okay, but I mean, they say that, I guess, with his first wife or whatever, I don't know, something happened, whatever. <laughs> okay. I, I find that very difficult to believe. I'm just wondering. Do you just because they don't name more doesn't mean that there aren't more. Sure. And, and where did he get most of his wives? Many of them were foreigners. The Bible's very specific about that. They were foreigners. And so if they had children, they weren't counted in Jewish records. But I find that very difficult to believe. I do too. It's the first time I ever heard it. <laughs> so, who, who, was it a Jewish source that said that? No, it was... Uh, I, mean, <laughs> I would... I wouldn't be surprised if a Jewish source said that. It might have been. It was online somewhere. <laughs> so it has to be true. It has, has, has to be true. It was on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Solomon, I think, posted all his kids' pictures to Facebook so that everybody could see. Proverbs is written to my son, and how he never designates my sons if he would have had all sons. That, that, I think, has to be a Jewish bias. Um, Anyway, I find that very difficult to believe. <laughs> Rehoboam went to Shechem, and he's come to become the king over all of Israel at this point. 
came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon. By the way, in the previous chapter, you can read the account of why Jeroboam fled to Egypt. He had conspired against Solomon. Jeroboam was a great leader, and he had conspired against Solomon. He was caught, fled to Egypt to spare his life, and after Solomon dies, now he comes back to make Rehoboam the king. And, and I find it very difficult to believe, here we go using that phrase again, that, that he's coming innocently. Uh, he wasn't coming to join in the party and say, yes, we want a new king here. Let's anoint the, king of, or the son of Solomon as the king. <clears throat> he's obviously there at the right place at the right time. And when there's a trouble, you know, he's like Absalom, I think, to say, wait a second, you know, if, if you need another option, you know, if King David's too busy to listen to you, why don't you tell me? And that's the way he treats this. Uh, you know, if the, if the tax burden is too heavy, I'll make it lighter for you. And he steps in at the last minute, kind of like what Biden now he's putting out. He was waiting for Hillary to tank. And as soon as he's waiting in the wings, and he's, you know, I've learned that it's never too late to say no to run for president. Well, he announced three months ago he was not running. It was too late. Well, three months later, he's putting his kind of feelers back out there. And anyway, that's kind of what happens here with Jeroboam. Verse 3, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous, now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. Now we've already last semester look at, looked at some of the details of the split, so let's just quickly uh, uh, go through this. <clears throat> we see that Rehoboam reigned for 17 years, and the dividing of the nation takes place according to this. First of all, there was a request to Rehoboam in chapter uh, 12, I believe. Yes, it should say chapter 12 there. Uh, Jeroboam complained, and he and the leaders of the ten northern tribes demand that Rehoboam treat them better than Solomon had. You know, as long as everything's going fine and people are, are you know, having a grand, old, majestic party all the time, like they did in Solomon's days, um, people don't normally mind paying the taxes when they're getting some return from it. But the people obviously were very, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Disenfranchised. Okay. They were disenfranchised. The northern tribes felt that they were paying all these taxes along with everybody else and weren't seeing any return on that. Now, it's kind of like, you know, you're from the D.C. area. People around Washington, D.C., boy, you know, I hear it's one of the wealthiest counties in the United States or one of the wealthiest states and cities. Well, everybody around there, of course, is going to enjoy the benefits of that. Now, you pay more for your, your things. You, the prices are generally much higher. But you also make much more. And so they, they enjoy that. But the rest of the country, especially certain parts of it that aren't seeing the benefits of that, are saying, wait a second, you know, we're the ones throwing up the, the red flag. You know, this isn't right. So we don't like you, Jacob. <laughs> um, and that's very much how it was in the northern tribes. Everybody around Jerusalem said, hey, this is great. The, the, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, they were fine with it. Well, they're seeing the benefits of it personally. And the northern tribes are saying, this just isn't right. We're paying all this money and we're being taken advantage of. The taxes are too high. And so they complain about it. The request was that he lower the taxes. So Rehoboam has a conference. He meets with two different groups of advisors to see what to do. And of course, you know, the older men give wise advice and the younger men give wicked advice. Ridiculous. Uh, the, the old men said, Rehoboam, you lower the taxes and these people will serve you faithfully. But if you keep them the same or raise them, these people are going to turn against you. And the young men said, oh, no, 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 man. You know what a leader does? 
a leader puts the foot down. Man, you just, you just put it down and make them listen. This is a coup. This is a, this is a rebellion. And you have to be a strong leader and just stomp it out. And, of course, Rehoboam, in a very foolish way, listens to these younger men. What, what do you make of the book of Proverbs? It's written by Solomon, most likely to his son, Rehoboam. What does Solomon over and over again say in the book of Proverbs? That's bad English. What does he say in the book of Proverbs over and over and over again? Right? Listen. Pay, pay attention. Hear me. Give ear to the wise. Multitude of counselors. Okay? Talks about the hoary head. <laughs> okay? Well, it also talks a lot about the strange woman, and Solomon didn't heed that advice. The strange woman, if you look at the, what that word actually means, it means a foreigner. And Solomon married many, many, many foreigners. So I can just, you know, I, I, the book of Proverbs is very true. By the way, because somebody doesn't live the book doesn't make the book not true. It makes that person inconsistent when they teach one thing and do something else. And so I'm convinced Rehoboam here has just watched his dad all his life and said, you know, of course you're supposed to do that, but it, that's not what he did, and so it must not be uh, very important. And so Rehoboam follows the advice of the younger men and uh, Foolishly turns away the people. He refuses uh, the refusal. He warns the people that he'll be even harsher than Solomon. Notice, notice how he puts this. <clears throat> Verse 9, he said to them, What counsel give you that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And they said, Thy father, here's what you say unto them, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter in us. My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. Now, whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scorpions. And so he takes three days to think about it. And when the people come back together, he tells them this. Oh, what a fool. Uh, by the way, young men, and ladies, but mostly the men. Um, you, you take a ministry over from somebody. You better have wisdom. And you better not make foolish decisions like this. Okay? Um, I'm just saying, you know, I'm not saying one way or the other because every situation is different. But just because you see something that isn't right doesn't mean you're going to change it right now. Use wisdom. Seek advice. And by the way, don't seek advice from your roommates. They're the young men. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying a wise person is going to seek advice from somebody who has experience. That makes sense. Um, so go to, to, so go to uh, some deacons and find out what they think. No. Right? Go to somebody who's never pastored before and find out what they think. Of course not. Go to a Southern Baptist and find out what they think. Of course not, right? You get the point. Go to somebody that's, that's right down the line, that's somebody that you trust their opinion and respect them, and, and seek their advice. Um, you know, I'm not saying compromise. I'm not saying put up with things, you know, but I'm saying have wisdom. You're not going to change everything to the way you like it in the first year that you're at a ministry. I'm just putting that out there. <clears throat> All right. So there's a revolt against Rehoboam, and Jeroboam is made the leader of the new kingdom. <clears throat> um, there's a letter, capital letter F there. Adoram, his tax collector, was killed trying to collect. 
And I don't have the passage there, but if you go down to verse 18. Then King Rehoboam, this is after the, the Israelites said, Up, oh, every man to his own tent. Look at verse 16 first. Uh, what portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. We have no part. We have been disenfranchised. And that's a big word. That means we, we have no part. We have no connection to you anymore. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. King Rehoboam said, Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get up to his chariot to go fight them. No, that's not what he says. He got to his chariot and he fled to Jerusalem. Okay, so he got out of there. He knew he was, he was the next one to get stoned if he stuck around there. All right, next, move on. The details of the kingdom. Now, this is the, of the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom. And I don't know why all my... Oh, 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 that's why. Second Chronicles is the, are the, the passages that I have next to it. Chapter 10 is uh, in Second Chronicles chapter 10, the request to Reboam, chapter 11. So uh, now we need to go to Second Chronicles to see this next uh, main point here. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 10. I'm sorry, chapter 11. We already discussed everything in chapter 10. Second Chronicles chapter 11. When Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered of the house of Judah and Benjamin. So he's fled to Jerusalem, and now he immediately decides to attack the northern kingdom. You can't leave. <laughs> it's funny to me, you know, it's the opposite of uh, what happened in the United States. The northern kingdom tried to keep the southern kingdom from leaving in, and I say kingdom, the north tried to keep the south from seceding. And here the southern kingdom tries to keep the northern kingdom from seceding. <clears throat> when Rehoboam has come to Jerusalem, he gathered the house of Judah and Benjamin, and hundred fourth score thousand, hundred and eighty thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against Israel, that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. So he goes to bring these rebels back to his own nation. Verse 2, But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. There's a prophet for you, the man of God. And Shemaiah said, Ye shall not go up, verse 4, nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. I did this. Rehoboam, you were a fool. Your father uh, brought this upon you. This is what God is doing. It's, you know, I don't want to talk here about the will of God, but this is God's will. Because of your sin, God's punishing you. So, every man returned to the house, and they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. Okay, so instead of, see, we, we see here his restraint. Instead of attacking the north... He decides to do the opposite, and that is to build up his defenses, his reinforcements. Verse 5, Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. Now, that's exactly what he's doing. Is he's protecting, he's building cities to protect their country from the northern kingdom. By the way, uh, can you imagine the volatility here? Uh, everybody's not knowing what's going to happen next. The north is afraid of the south, and the south is saying there's no way. I mean, when they seceded, they're definitely going to attack us. So he immediately builds up how many cities here? Bethlehem, Edom, Tekoa, those are all south towards Bethlehem. Bethzur, Shoko, Adullam, that's over to the east towards the Philistines. Gath, Meret, Merisha, Ziph, Adoram, Lachish, Azekah. Zorah, Aijalon, Hebron, those are all cities in Judah. 
and they reinforced those cities, fortified the strongholds, and put captains in them, store of victual and of oil and of wine. So he put uh, a bunch of storage there of food in case of siege. So his restraint, his reinforcement. Now, verse uh, 13 tells us some things about some refugees. Oh boy, that's a common term these days. The priests and the Levites that were in all Israel. Now, are you following this? They're in Israel resorting to Jerob, I'm sorry, to Rehoboam out of all their coasts. They are refugees from the northern kingdom coming down to the southern kingdom. What are they? The priests and the Levites. Who are these people? What kind of people are they? Uh, not yet. Okay, I'm asking a very general question, actually. Are these, yes, Joel? Levites, or priests, the people that saw through the house of God, and the other king was killing them, chasing them around. Sure, at least leaving the truth. Okay, very good. So these are godly people as a whole. These are very religious people. These are the best of the north. Okay, uh, you know, this is hypothetical, but you know, for us conspiracy theorists, not too wildly hypothetical. If our country, which was founded, if this country, which is founded on biblical principles as a whole, on Christianity as a whole, if this country were to go completely over the edge and, and persecuting Christians, the best people in our country are Christians. And many, many, many Christians would leave this country and go to Canton. No, they would go somewhere. They would go to Alaska, right? Um, that, I'm sure that's what would happen. I'm not saying I wouldn't. In fact, I don't know if I would or not. I wouldn't think about it. I definitely. And what would happen? The best people are leaving the country to go somewhere else. Okay, and that's, that's what's happening here. These priests and Levites... For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. Now, they left their homes. Remember, Levites don't have their own inheritance. Their inheritance is scattered amongst the, the, the land of Israel in the different cities and the suburbs. And they left that and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem for Jeroboam and his sons and cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. He ordained him priest for the high places. Remember what Jeroboam did. Can you remember? Anybody who was in last semester's class? Four things that he changed. At least four, maybe five. Changed the feasts. Changed the priesthood to the common people. Changed the symbols of worship. Who said times? That changed the times. The feast days were moved a month later or a month earlier, I forget. And change the places of worship. Okay, so he changed all this, and all these religious people said, wait a second, we're going back to the temple at Jerusalem where we've always gone to. And so they moved. They left their possession. How'd you like to do that? Put a backpack on, put all your stuff that you can carry in there, and start walking with your family. And not knowing what's going to happen. Verse 16. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. I think that's a key phrase. This is, our, this is who we've always worshipped. Our fathers worship. We're going to worship here too. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong. Three years, for three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. Ugh. Three years, that's all. All right, so the refugees, because of Jeroboam's idolatry and weakness, many Levites flee the northern kingdom and settle in and around Jerusalem. Next, you see also his relationship. This is Rehoboam. He also follows in the ways of his father. He had 18 wives, 60 concubines. That's only 78. 
you know, so he's, uh, what is that, like a, about a 12, 15% of his father. Isn't that what that is? Somewhere around that. So he's doing really good, you know, he's a step in the right direction. <clears throat> 28 sons and 60 daughters, my goodness. I guess I have three daughters and one son, so my percentage is even worse than that. But that's a bigger sample size. 28 and 60. All right. Um, look at uh, verse 20. After her, he took Maacah, the daughter of Absalom. <clears throat> the daughter of Absalom. Uh, David was Rehoboam's grandfather, and Absalom was David's son, so Maacah would be his, his cousin. Second cousin or first cousin? First cousin. Rehoboam loved Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. Rehoboam made Abijah the son of Maacah the chief to be ruler among his brethren, for he thought to make him king. All right. So what do you think about that? The gene pool is shrinking. But what does it mean? What, what do you think is the significance that he loved this particular wife way more than any of the others? <laughs> Shouldn't play favorites with his wives. So you, you guys all remember that. You know, that's a very important lesson learned. <laughs> no? Absalom, great guy, right? I mean, just the model of uh, character and honesty and integrity. Okay. Joel, what do you think? She was probably good looking because... I thought of that also. No character and good looking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Ouch. These two young ladies up here are like, uh, wait a second. <laughs> we can have both. <laughs> so, uh, but I did think of that. Solomon, or Absalom was, was very handsome, you know. Ugh, I don't even like to say that. <laughs> but, uh, but his daughter probably was the same. And I would, you know, we can just assume. We don't know this. But... He, uh, Rehoboam obviously is forsaking the Lord, and this is his favorite wife, so it means that she also was not a good Christian, and it probably means that she was uh, like her father, Absalom. Chapter 12, verse 1. Came to pass, and Rehoboam had strengthened, I'm sorry, established the kingdom, had strengthened himself. He forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord with 1,200 chariots, threescore thousand horsemen, and the people without number that came with him out of Egypt. The Lubims, the Sukkims, the Ethiopians, by the way, all of those groups are from, from uh, Africa, going south from Egypt. And if you look at your history... Um, those people are powerful people. And the Egyptians had waged war against them much more than they had against kingdoms of the north. These are powerful groups. And here they had joined together and were obviously going to the north. They probably weren't attacking primarily Jerusalem, but God was using them to punish His people. He took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah... That's those cities that Rehoboam had strengthened and reinforced. <laughs> oh, so much for those cities. And now he comes to Jerusalem. Verse 5, Then came Shemaiah the prophet. Um, this is the same prophet who we find in chapter 11. 
uh, verse number two, the man of God, Shemaiah, to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Whereupon the prince of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. So they humbled themselves. Verse 9, The king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And so what does Rehoboam do? He instead, he doesn't go and rescue them. He doesn't attack the king of Egypt. He makes some substitute for them. Shields of brass. They look nice. They're still shiny. <laughs> but everybody knows they're not as valuable as the real thing. All right, so the downfall of Rehoboam is rebellion against the Lord, the retribution from the king of Egypt, and then the repentance when he spares Jerusalem, but he takes the treasures of the palace. Okay, any questions or comments there on Rehoboam? It's interesting to me that as bad as he was, twice, Shemaiah, the man of God, comes to him and says, don't do that. And both times they listen to him. So they're still a little bit sensitive here. Uh, you can definitely see that. All right, his son takes over. <clears throat> Rehoboam wanted to make his son Abijam the next king, or Abijah. Is it, uh, maybe it's both. Abijah, verse 22 of chapter 11. But if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 15, it's Abijam. 1 Kings 15, verse 1. <clears throat> Abijam reigned over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Mecca, the daughter of Absalom. He walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect. The Lord his God is the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and establish Jerusalem. <clears throat> there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. And that's about all that it tells us about Abijam. He did evil like his father. He defeated Jeroboam's army. Um, Abijam and Jeroboam, verse 7, there was war between them. All right, so there isn't much on his son. He reigned for three years and he was wicked like his father. Next, let's move on to Asa. I love Asa. Um, he did a lot of very good things, and then at the end he blew it. But uh, as a whole, I, I love some of the things that he did. Um, he's, he's an early king in Judah, and so he's trying to bring Judah. You know, sometimes when you mess up, it's kind of futile. You say, well, you know, whatever, you know, I'm tired of this, whatever. The Bible says, a just man falleth seven times and riseth again. And Asa, I think Asa knows, I think all these kings in the southern kingdom know that the, the kingdom will never come together again in their lifetime for sure. But yet they want to follow the Lord. And Asa is one of these. He says, I don't care what happens in the north. I don't care what they do. I don't care what previous kings did before me. I'm going to do what's right. And I love the, that, you know, you, of course, we know that there's a number of good kings in the southern kingdom that do these kinds of things. But Asa is the first one to do that, to be a good king in spite of his own father and his own grandfather and so on. 1 Kings chapter 15, uh, verse number 9. <clears throat> in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, that's the north, reigned Asa over Judah. Forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. That's Absalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. Now, note down, or no, I say note down, sorry, you have it. His reforms, this is what I'm talking about. First of all, in verse 12, he took away the Sodomites out of the land. Well, it's just, it's completely out of the blue, you know. I mean, we don't know that there were Sodomites in the land. All of a sudden, 
He removed them. He removed them. Uh, there must have been a little island out in the Mediterranean that he moved them to and blew it up. And I know, I don't know that. Sorry, that's on video, isn't it? You'll have to subtract that, you know. <clears throat> anyway, he took the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Well, he had a brother, probably a half-brother or something like that. Uh, named uh, Abijam, <laughs> and uh, he had a father, Rehoboam, and a father, Solomon, who had allowed these idols to be built on. By the way, these idols weren't just scattered, you know, in, you know, out on top of a hill in a grove of trees. Solomon built temples in Jerusalem. So the, some of these gods and idols that were set up were in Jerusalem itself cohabiting with the real temple. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. And so he removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Well, they had a father and a grandfather, I guess it would be, that they had made. Verse 13, And also, Maacah his mother, even her he removed from being queen, because she had made an idol in a grove. All right, wait a second. A queen? It's the first time. I know a king's wife is technically a queen. But this is the first time that it indicates that a queen had a position more than being the wife of the king. Okay? She doesn't, she's not the wife of the king, is she? Her husband is dead. Right? Rehoboam, he's gone. And here she still has a position of authority and honor. All right, I love this fact. I mean, he said, my own mother is not fit to be the king, the queen. And he removed her. Why did he remove her? Because she had made an idol in a grove... And Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kidron. Anybody else who burnt their uh, parent's idol and broke it down at least? Maybe not burnt it, but broke it down back a long time before this? Uh, one of the judges. Jeroboam was his Gideon. other name. Gideon. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Gideon broke down his father's idol. But evidently he had put the word out that if anybody's caught with a different idol, that they're going to be, their, their position or whatever, they'll be punished. And his own mother has an idol and won't take it away. And so he finds it, evidently, and when he finds it, he removes her from being the queen. But it's very interesting that she's the first queen in, in Israel, a person of authority and a position and honor. Verse 14, but the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. He dedicates the vessels of the house of the Lord. Um, during his time, there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days, and Baasha, the king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah that he might not suffer any to go out or to come into Asa, king of Judah. That Ramah, you might remember who, who was from Ramah? A different Ramah, but close by. Uh, was it Omri? No. It was, huh? Samuel. Samuel, that's correct. Samuel was from Ramah. The word Ramah, it means a hill. A hill. And so what he did is he built a hill or he fortified a hill just north of Jerusalem. If you look at the map here, <clears throat> here's uh, Jerusalem. Just north of Jerusalem here is, is the, the northern kingdom. And Ramah is somewhere close to Bethel where Samuel lived. So it's almost for sure some location close to that. And he fortified a hill there 
Why? To keep, uh, that he might not suffer any to go out or to come in to Asa, king of Judah. He's blocking his own people from going to Jerusalem. That's pretty bad. When you have to keep your people in. Okay, there's countries around the world, many of them like that. They build walls not to keep the people out. We should build walls to keep people out, right? They build walls to keep their people from leaving. Okay? No comments. No further comments. All right, verse 18. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasure of the house, and the treasure of the king's house, and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And he sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hirzion, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying... I want to make a league between me and you, between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent unto thee a present. That present is not a present, it's a tribute, it's a bribe. Come and break thy league with Baesh, a king of Israel, that he may depart from me. Help me out. Uh, Baesh has built a uh, fence, basically, a wall to keep his people. He's, he's hurting our commerce. So Ben-Hadad hearkened unto King Asa, and he attacks the northern kingdom for Asa. Verse 21, came to pass, and Baasha heard thereof that he left off building of Ramah and dwelt in Tirzah. That's where the capital of the northern kingdom was and before Samaria was built. Then King Asa made a proclamation to all Judah. None was exempted, and they took away the stones of Ramah, the timber thereof. They took away all the building supplies that were left there. And uh, he built with that Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah and so on. All right, note that, or you see there. Um, oh, I, I missed uh, the first, the next point there. Uh, let's go on there. His sins in chapter, uh, in this chapter of 1 Kings, but we'll see it also in 2 Chronicles 16, where he, where King Baish of Israel attacks Judah, Asa bribes the uh, Damascus, the city of Damascus, to attack Israel. And, of course, they do that. If you go over to 2 Chronicles, now chapter 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles 15 and 16 are about Asa as well, as, we, as you see on your uh, handout there. Let me have you jump to chapter 16 first to wrap up this uh, point. <clears throat> Uh, First Kings doesn't tell us this, but as soon as, as uh, Damascus, as soon as they attacked the northern kingdom, Hanani the seer, verse 7, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said, Hey, why didn't you trust in the Lord to protect you? Why would you go out and make a league with a foreign king instead of trusting the Lord? Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thy hand. They are going to punish you someday, and you could have attacked them yourself and wiped them out. And then he reminds them what had happened before this. So let's go to back to chapter 15 that we missed in 1 Kings. But 2 Chronicles chapter 15 tells us about a great, great victory that Asa wins over the Egyptians because they trusted in the Lord. <clears throat> um, the Egyptians come and attack them. Oh, let's see here. Where is this? Oh, the end of chapter 14, the Egyptians come. And uh, Azariah, a prophet, comes to Asa and says, Look, you just need to trust the Lord. He'll deliver you if you do right. Verse 8, chapter 15, verse 8. When Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin, out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh, that's the north, and out of Simeon, that's in the south, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. And boy, did he go after those Egyptians. By the way, I believe, I believe that when he removed his grandmother 
and he removed the idols and these other things, that, that the reason he did that was because of the Egyptians. It was at that point when he trusted in the Lord and said, we're going to really clean house. And God will give us the victory over these Egyptians. And, and it was at that point, in the end of chapter 15, is when you see him removing his grandmother and cutting down the groves and, and, uh, and so on. Anyway, so the Ethiopians, that's it, I keep saying Egyptians. It starts with the same letter. The Ethiopians attack with a huge army. He cries out to the Lord for help, and the Lord delivers them miraculously. Uh, verse 9 tells us about this, chapter 14, verse 9, how many he had. The Ethiopians had a host of a thousand thousand. That's a million people. This is the million man march. <laughs> And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I just think if there's anything, you know, the Ethiopians had was just a lot of people. Sheer numbers. The Bible tells us they had only 300 chariots and a million man army. So, just huge numbers of, of soldiers. All right, and Asa gets a great victory over them. So, his service, his salvation, and his sins. At the end of his life... He develops a foot disease and refuses to turn to the Lord for help. And he dies of that foot disease. Probably athlete's foot. Or, no, I'm kidding. Um, something that made him lame and the infection spread throughout his body. Okay? Yes? I don't know. I've all, that, him and the foot disease always seems really ambiguous. It's kind of like, why? Why a foot disease? <laughs> I don't know, it's like, I don't, and then all of a sudden, I don't know, he would have had a good testimony, and then at the end, it's just, he goes to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> like, what did he do? I mean... Well, he reigned for a total of 41 years, so it was we don't know when Zera attacked in that 41 years. Mm -hmm. So, it looks like, to me, I've always understood it as pretty early in his, in his reign, and then he cleaned everything up, and he moved out the idols... And probably it was a long, drawn-out process of him falling away from the Lord. Uh, it could have easily been the last 20 years. And then, you know, he went kerplunk, you know, at the end, as you put it. So, in chapter uh, 16, I think this is interesting, verse number 12, Asa, in the 39th year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Uh, some have suggested that it was some kind of the gout. Um, and anyway, in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. That's, that's not, you know, oh, he forgot. He forgot to pray. That's not what that's saying. He would not seek the Lord. He said, I don't need his help. And they buried him in his own sepulcher, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed, which was filled with sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices, prepared by the apothecary's art. And they made a very great burning for him. This is, uh, if you're in my uh, Bible geography class, there's a plenty of interesting cultural clues there about things that they did at that time. Okay, that brings us then to his son, Jehoshaphat, and uh, he was a very good king, and uh, we'll pick up with him in our next class period on Monday.